Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Apples and Genos Fantasy Hockey Podcast. My name is Naker Nibblink. I'm the creator of Apples and Genos, originator of the Zero G Draft Strategy. And in this podcast, I'm going to break down all the advanced statistics you hear us reference on this podcast all the time and how you can apply them for fantasy purposes. Let's get it. Now, unfortunately, I do not have your best friend and my best friend, Blake Creamer, with me. It's just me, Solo, coming to you for a Christmas special episode, I guess. Merry Christmas, everyone. Happy holidays. Best wishes from all of us here at A&G to you and yours. Uh, but I wanted to get this episode out there. I've had some requests for something along these lines to get out some sort of discussion on the advanced stats I use, why I use them, their predictive power, how they are to be used, uh, why I use them the way that I use them, all these sorts of conversations. And so I've been looking for an opportunity to get this out there for a while and uh, figured this was a good opportunity. It was going to be tough for Blake and I to get a recording in on Christmas Eve. I don't think either of our wives would have appreciated uh, that recording happening so uh, we'll get I'm getting this done here on the 23rd on Saturday and I'll get this out there for you so that you have some content over the break to consume at your leisure while you're sitting around the tree uh, avoiding <laughs> looking at everyone uh, getting the presents that you uh, spent so little time uh, <laughs> purchasing for them. Now, I'm sure your presents were all terrific. I'm sure everyone's going to have a great Christmas and holidays here. But let's get into the advanced stats. I am running this just in one take, so if I stumble over some words you're gonna just have to bear with me i wanted to get this out there on youtube too so i wanted to do a recording video recording live recording and not edit the crap out of it um, so bear with me if there are some stumbles and i have to go back and explain some things because i didn't quite get it the first time but we'll get through it together so first off, I'm just going to run through the advanced stats that I use on a day-to-day -day basis that you hear me talk about all the time on the podcast. Just go through some definitions, make sure everybody's on the same page. If you feel pretty confident about this part, you could skip through. I'm probably going to talk a little bit of uh, strategy and usage throughout, though, so it should be good content regardless for you. Uh, first off, uh, the one thing that I should clarify kind of up front is I talk a lot about rate stats versus the actual counts. So the actual counts would obviously be the goal scored is a count of one, right? The shot attempt, uh, one shot attempt, two shot attempts. Um, but what you hear me reference a lot on the podcast and what I've kind of coached the other guys into doing as well is to talk about uh, rate stats uh, on a per 60 minute basis. So how many shot attempts does a player uh, generate per 60 minutes of ice time? Um, this is simply because it's a lot easier to comp compare players on a per minute basis or per 60 minute basis uh, because not all players get the same amount of deployment. And uh, sure, you can... Uh, just compare the total counts and take into account the ice time they're getting after the fact. But I prefer being having the stats being the thing that you can compare people side uh, players side by side on, and then use the uh, time on ice as a factor after. Uh, kind of after doing that initial comparison because time on ice is variable as we know we have coaches out there like John Tortorella who likes to mess with his lines we have yeah all sorts of coaches across the league making very questionable lineup decisions all the time so I like to use the rate stats as my basis and then kind of use the ice time as the multiplier for those rate stats um because basically that's what it is, right? You get the rate stats, how much can they produce per minute, and then you multiply it by the minutes they're actually getting, and that equals the production, the actual um, counts, the actual goals, the actual assists, the actual shots that they're producing for you. That's how you do the math on that. 
And now you'll also hear me talk a lot about individual stats versus on ice stats. Um, so individual stats are pretty basic, right? And it makes sense. It's the shots generated by that player. It's the chances generated by that player, their chances, their shot attempts, their scoring chances, uh, the ones that the puck is on their stick and they're the last player to touch it before it goes towards the net. That's pretty easy to understand. The on ice stats are just the numbers for the whole team while they're on the ice. That's why they're called on ice stats. It makes a lot of sense as well. So Basically, the way that I kind of view these, I view them as like two parts of a whole. Basically, you need both to develop a um, holistic view of a player for sure. Individual stats are great for predicting goal scoring. Uh, on ice stats are great for predicting total point production. I'll dig into all of that a little bit more once we get into the individual statistics and metrics and how I use them, how I use them for projection, all those sorts of things. But um, yeah, individual stats are kind of more typically um, uh, slanted and um, how I view them anyway, I guess, is what I should say is I view them um, more towards that their goal production, that player's goal production or projected goal production. And then the on-ice stats uh, are more so about their total point uh, scoring ability. Again, yeah, I'll dig into all that specifically once we get into uh, a bit more of the metrics and those individual numbers there. So... I'll start off just by going through all the shot or chance stats that you'll hear us commonly reference. So obviously you hear me talk about shots per 60. That one's pretty straightforward. It's just the shots on goal per 60 minutes. Everyone, I think, kind of understands that one. Corsi 4 per 60 or shot attempts per 60, you'll hear me reference a fair bit, uh, commonly abbreviated CF uh, slash 60, uh, anywhere you see it online. So yeah, that's literally just any shot attempt. Doesn't matter what happens with the puck after it leaves the shooter's stick. It can be blocked, it can go wide, it can go off the post, it can go into the stands. Whatever happens after that attempted shot is fired, that still is a single Corsi 4 um, event. Then there's also Fenwick 4. I don't really use this one, but it can be used in some cases uh, it's just a little bit harder to understand and explain and i don't really think there's a predictive uh, usage for it in my opinion and the research that i've done uh, but fenwick 4 is basically any unblocked shot attempt um, so any again it's still shot attempts but it's ones that weren't actually blocked by an opposing player before it got to the net so it can still be a post or it can still be a shot attempt that was shot wide of the net uh, but was not blocked by an opposing player then there's scoring chance for or scf that you'll hear me reference a lot uh, this is actually defined differently by different resources. It's usually just some sort of formula-based calculation to determine if a shot attempt meets a certain threshold for a shot that is more likely to score than average. I'll include a link in the show description uh, for Natural Stat Trick and their glossary, how they define all their terms. Uh, you may want to dig into that if you're as much of a nerd about these sorts of things as I am, but I'll include that there for those who are so inclined. Uh, just as a reference, reference uh, to kind of give you a idea of how this uh, number relates to shot attempts in general 48.5 percent of all shot attempts this season have been registered as scoring chances under natural stat tricks model so take that for what it's worth uh, basically just a little less than half of all shot attempts are actual legitimate scoring chances according to natural stat tricks model the one thing that I have found about scoring chances for is that it's very predictive of goal scoring. I prefer to use when just looking at these metrics and deciding which one I want to rely on a little bit more for predicting player performance. Um, I prefer scoring chances for, for forwards specifically, and obviously forwards score the most of the goals, and that's why scoring chances for is a really good indicator. Uh, I prefer scoring chances for for forwards, and uh, Corsi 4 is actually pretty good for defensemen. This is just based on typical shooting locations for the two positions, right? It stands to reason defensemen are going to take more shots from further away from the net just by virtue of their position. And so I don't want to penalize... Um, the defensemen for not getting into uh, scoring chance opportunities. Certainly there are defensemen, you know, I think of a guy like Dougie Hamilton, who has 
consistently generated really good individual scoring chance for numbers. Uh, Roman Yossi, another great example. Uh, these guys often get to these uh, more dangerous shot attempt areas, and certainly that's valuable. But the average defenseman is not doing that a whole lot. Uh, but they still can be directing a lot of shot attempts. And so Corsi 4, individual Corsi 4, for those defensemen is a metric that is worth looking at, in my opinion. Um, in general, though, scoring chances for is the most predictive metric of goal scoring that I've found, at least in natural stat tricks. Um, repertoire, I guess. There is also high danger chances for, you'll hear some people reference this from time to time. This does follow the same model as scoring chances for. Uh, it's basically just a more dangerous scoring chance. Uh, so it, all scoring chances are high danger chances for, uh, but high danger chances for are the scoring chances that are deemed even more likely to result in a goal. However, I've found this metric to be less predictive uh, than scoring chances for. There's actually less of a correlation there. Um, and I think the reason for this is that some Netfront guys, James Van Riemsdyk, just looking at the list of individual high danger chance for generators on this season, guys like James Van Riemsdyk, Anders Lee, Brandon Gallagher all show up really well in individual high danger chances for. And those guys are kind of just Netfront guys who like will jam away at a couple of pucks and maybe just jam them at the goalie's pad. And that's registered as a high danger chance for, but it never really had a chance of going in the net to begin with. Um, and so I've just found that the high danger chances for it doesn't actually translate to goal production as consistently. There's also expected goals for, this is again a model, it considers a number of factors to assign a danger value to every single shot attempt and the likelihood that it becomes a goal. Uh, natural statics model is not as good at predicting goals as scoring chances for it is, which is an interesting uh a thing to note. Uh, Mark Barber at 18 Skaters um, on Twitter, uh, obviously a great writer for Apples and Genos. He did some correlation analysis that he shared with me. He found the same thing I did that, yeah, their expected goals model is just not as good at predicting goals as their scoring chance for uh, model. So that's why I re constantly refer to scoring chances for, and you don't hear me refer to expected goals for, uh, because the data I'm using is from Natural Statric, and the best data is the scoring chances for. A shout out to Mark Barber and his uh, personal expected goals model, which is actually slightly better than even scoring chances for in predicting goals. So definitely you should check that out and uh, talk to him if you want some ideas about who might be scoring some more goals in the near future as well. Uh, so those are all the shot and chance generation numbers that you'll typically hear me talk about, the rate stats uh, that you'll hear me talk about. Obviously, those can be uh, on an individual basis, the ones that come from the individual player, but they can also be the on-ice stats as well. They're the same stats, just uh, from the individual or from the team while that individual is on the ice. Um, both are valuable, and we'll get into that even more here. Then there's the luck metrics, the quote unquote luck metrics that you hear me talk about. It's a little bit of a misnomer because there are players who sustain um, higher higher percentages in these quote unquote luck metrics. Um, and so those players, we shouldn't penalize them for having high numbers in the luck metrics as if we expect that they'll regress because they probably won't. They have shown that they're capable of sustaining high numbers, uh, high percentages, high efficiency play in these arenas. So, um, but the one thing I will say about these metrics uh, is that unless the player's situation changes, these metrics are typically varying very little from season to season. They're generally reliable indicators of the player's point production potential. Uh, if you look at a player and they're scoring far more than usual during a certain period, you know, a streak of a few games, a few months, half a season, full season, whatever it is, it's usually because they're being far more efficient than they usually are in one or multiple of these metrics. And in some like 90 plus percent of these cases, that eventually regresses to the mean, at least to some extent, not necessarily all the way back to their career averages, but at least to some extent, it usually does regress. 
you'll always have outliers. You know, William Carlson's 43-goal season, he shot 23.4% that year, hasn't eclipsed 14.2% in any season since, although he is shooting 16.3% on the season right now, for whatever that's worth. You'll always have these outliers where a player just goes off and is insanely efficient for an entire season, but they are outliers. They are not the norm. They are not predictable, uh, and we shouldn't try to predict those. Uh, so you'll always have those outliers, but let's actually talk about what these metrics are. There are three that I typically talk about that I use to project and predict player performance. The first one is IPP, individual points percentage. Uh, this is a really simple calculation, a percentage calculation. Out of all the goals scored while this player was on the ice, what percentage did that player factor into? Either scored the goal or got one of the assists uh, on the goals that were scored while that player was on the ice um, really good players you know the high-end superstars will be up close to 80 percent sometimes above in really good seasons um, typically that's not sustainable for the average player and so if you see a more average player with a mark up in that range usually that means they're going to regress and if you see by the same token if you see a player who usually like say has a 60 something percent ipp and they're down at 40% on the season, you can say, hey, that that's probably going to come back up. They're probably going to start factoring into some more goals here. That's, uh, that's pretty um, just unlucky. And that's where the term luck metrics obviously comes from. So there's IPP, then there's shooting percentage. Uh, you might hear me say or someone else say individual shooting percentage. Really simple calculation here as well, obviously. Goals divided by shots. This is uh, actually somewhat predictable. Uh, Typically, a player's shooting percentage doesn't vary um, much at all throughout their career. Like usually, like within a band of like plus or minus two percent throughout a player's career, you'll see them stick pretty closely within that, and so it is fairly predictable, uh, season to season. And you can also get an idea of what a player might typically do uh, via individual scoring chances for per shot. So if a player has more individual scoring chances for per shot on goal uh, that generally means that they're just getting more dangerous attempts than other players and so you might expect that a player like that could sustain a higher shooting percentage and you'll see this with a lot of players that do sustain high shooting percentages year after year after year is that they do have high individual scoring chances for per shot um, if you uh, take individual scoring chances for and divide it by the shot um and yeah just see that ratio uh, that comparison then you can kind of get an idea of uh, whether that shooting percentage is sustainable by the same token if you see that a player uh, i was just looking at matt boldy matt boldy's shots per 60 has gone down this year but his individual scoring chances for per 60 has gone up his shooting percentage this year is also up uh, by only a couple percent but uh, I would consider that sustainable, this new shooting percentage at a higher percentage because he's getting more dangerous attempts even though he's getting less shots on goal overall. Uh, then there's also on ice shooting percentage. So again, goals divided by shots, but it's for the whole team, not just the individual player. Goals divided by shots for the whole team while that player is on the ice. And again, typically this doesn't vary a lot unless the player's situation changes. You know, they're playing with different players, they get traded to a new team, what have you. If the situation changes, then obviously all bets are off and things will change definitely with the on ice shooting percentage. They have obviously for uh, a lot of reasons less control over their on ice shooting percentage than the other numbers but it typically does not vary a whole lot from season to season for most players as long as their situation isn't changing a lot all right so that's that now let's talk about some of the practical uses of advanced stats how i'm using them obviously the number one reason i look at these is i want to try to predict player performance so first off, not every player conforms to the same standards. We obviously generalize and we try to, you know, take into account what we know to be true in general. Uh, but the best predictor of a player's performance is how they perform before in similar situations, uh, not a regression to some average of a league-wide standard. The player's performance, their past performance, is the best indicator of what they will do moving forward, not, you know, some regression to a, a league-wide average. Uh, I really don't factor in league-wide numbers um, 
pretty much whatsoever uh, in a player's performance. Uh, the only scenario in which I do do that is um, basically I've noticed in recent years that um, teams and players have become more efficient. The shooting percentages across the league are up. Um, and so I tend to just kind of believe a higher shooting percentage a little bit more. But again, that is reflected in higher individual scoring chance for rates as well. So they're being more dangerous with their shots. It's not just that suddenly players uh, were taking the exact same shots as they were before, and but now more of them are going in, like goalies got worse or something like that. That's not the case. It's that they're actually just figuring out how to get more dangerous shot attempts so uh, again it's it's all predictable <laughs> Uh, that being said, of course, players progress, regress throughout their careers for various reasons. We need to be cognizant of the reasons that can happen so we can identify it when they do. The top three reasons a player progresses are very clear in my mind. There's age-related progression, um, you know, players' first few years in the league. It's an increase in rate stats, typically. Uh, so you'll see the shots per 60 come up. You'll see the individual scoring chances for per 60 come up. You'll see even the on-ice stats come up. They're driving play more even for their teammates. They're passing better. They're making their teammates more dangerous by the way that they're moving with the puck. All these sorts of things will start to come up. And that can be real progression, especially at an early age for young players in their first you know, two to four seasons in the league. You'll, you might see this age-related progression in a lot of cases. Then there's also team-related progression. You know, playing with better players. A shocker, playing with better players makes you more likely to score points. Um, yeah, teammates increasing their rate stats. You know, if a teammate suddenly takes a leap, uh, they kind of figure it out at the NHL level. If their teammate improves that they've been playing with, obviously they're going to get some sort of um, uh, collateral effect of that improvement as well. And then thirdly, and possibly most importantly, is deployment. Better deployment just equals more production in 95% of cases, whether that's, you know, going from the second power play unit to the top power play unit, whether that's just more minutes in general, even like getting more shorthanded time on teams that emphasize uh, being able to counterattack with shorthanded opportunities. That can be uh, an area where a player can be a little bit more dangerous, add, you know, maybe five points on the season if they're being used a lot uh, in a shorthanded context where they weren't before. Um, but typically, it just looks like a promotion within, uh, within the team, like moving from the third line up to the second line, up to the first line, getting more time on ice, just necessitates basically in almost every case uh, you're going to get more opportunities to score by being on the ice more you're going to get more points as a result and then the top reasons a player might regress in the opposite direction it's just the inverse of the above right age-related regression a player gets old and they start to decline their talents start to decline they get slower um, they can't keep up anymore team related regression so you know the team trades away some players or they lose some to free agency um, whatever those cases may be a teammate starts to decline due to age whatever the case may be team related regression will obviously have an impact on player uh, production and then again deployment you get bumped down the lineup you come off the top power play unit whatever that case might look like that will obviously affect a player's ability to perform as well realistically um, just to bring this back to predicting player performance in general, player performance is, in my mind, a function of two things. You have volume of chance generation, and then you have efficiency. You multiply the two together, and you get player production. Chance generation, we measure this versus uh, via the rate stats that I've been mentioning and that I talk about all the time. The shots per 60, individual scoring chances 4 per 60, the on-ice Corsi 4 per 60, or on-ice scoring chances 4 per 60. These are the chance generation numbers that I'm talking about. So volume of chance generation is the first variable. And then efficiency, which is measurable via the luck metrics that we talked about there. And so it stands to reason then if a player is very efficient, you know, they have a consistently high individual points percentage, consistently high shooting percentage, consistently high on ice shooting percentage. They need less chance generation, less volume in chance generation in those rate stats to match the scoring output of a less efficient player who has more chance generation, right? The two multiply versus each other, and you can be less efficient with more chance generation, or you can be... Uh, really efficient but have less chance generation it can kind of equal out and wash out in those ways um, but 
where you get the superstars, where you get the breakout players, is when the players that have a high volume of chance generation are also efficient, right? When those two things come together, that's when a player is really performing well, really producing at a high level. When I do my projections, um, I obviously use that that basic uh, formula. I evaluate goal scoring and total point production separately. Uh, so for total points, uh, I take the on-ice shots per 60. I multiply that times the on-ice shooting percentage. That gives me the on-ice goals for per 60 for that player, right? Shots multiplied by the shooting percentage gives me the goals per 60. Uh, on-ice goals per 60 for that player. And I multiply that by the IPP that I think that player is going to have, the individual points percentage. You know, if I've projected that the player is going to be on ice for 100 goals and I project that their IPP is going to be 70%, then that player is going to be, uh, is going to factor in to 70 points on the season. That's bas the basic math, right? And then um, when I'm doing this, though, I'm multiplying by the rate stats. Uh, I should clarify that. So I'm multiplying by the rate stats, the per 60 numbers, and then I multiply that by the projected ice time to give me that total points scored. Um, so the math comes out to the same thing, uh, but uh, the last piece of that puzzle is the projected ice time. And that's why, obviously, deployment matters, because if you add suddenly two minutes per game that's a lot of extra minutes over the course of a season and it really does add up uh, goals you know goal production follows the same basic idea you have your shots for 60 multiply it by the shooting percentage gives you goals for 60 multiply it by the ice time you get total goals scored by the player for the season so that's the basic projection method. That's how I view players even in season. I'm still doing the same kind of calculus. You hear me, uh, you know, especially when I'm, we're going through the puzzling players uh, segments that I do, those live streams. Then I'm talking about these numbers. I'm saying, you know, on the season, I see that their IPP is this um, and that's low. And so if I, you know, kind of factor in what I think they'll get back to based on their historical numbers, what they've done in the past, then I think that that'll come up to about this level. That's a certain percentage more that they should factor into and that should result in a certain number more points and I give some sort of rest of season point projection in a lot of cases for these players based on that kind of calculus. So that's how I'm doing that. I uh, just wanted to get that out there so people can kind of think through the same process when they hear me talk about IPP, when they hear me talk about shooting percentage, when they hear me talk about on-ice shooting percentage and how that should come up by a certain number of percentage points. That's the math that I'm kind of doing in my head um, while I'm talking and trying to figure out exactly what we should be expecting from this player moving forward based on what we've seen. Uh, another thing, uh, not super related, but um, just talking about the puzzling players and the way that I commonly frame these sorts of discussions, I use these five game sample sizes commonly. I, this is just to see what how a player is performing in the moment. Um, if I use less than five games, I find like a sim single game outlier really just skews the numbers uh, a whole lot. And, you know, whatever happened in that game, it might be just a really unique circumstance. And I don't want that to just totally skew the numbers. So I don't want to use less than five games. But I found if I use more, then you start to get into situations where, you know, that player has been bounced from the third line to the top line, back to the third line again. Like situations have changed so much in a longer period of time that, um, again, it doesn't become all that indicative of their current performance level in a lot of cases. Uh, I will say that five-game sample sizes are not really predictive, but I would say they are kind of pre-predictive in that, you know, I want to see good advanced stats in recent games to give me confidence for continued production or pending breakout, whatever it may be. Still very useful uh, when identifying, you know, who's currently playing well for a one week or a couple of game stream, things like that. Still like to see those metrics for those kinds of things. And then obviously, the longer the sample size continues to be good, the more predictive it becomes and obviously the inverse is true as well the longer the sample size continues to be bad the more predictive it becomes so um, I use the five game sample size just as like a snapshot of their current play how they're doing currently uh, but the longer it is obviously the more predictive it becomes of uh, a player's potential to produce for us in fantasy over the long term uh, 
I want to switch over and talk about team stats because they are important. Uh, I do find I don't want to gloss over them. I do think about them very often, uh, probably more honestly than I talk about uh, on the podcast. Uh, but I will. I do want to just like preface this whole discussion by saying team performance varies significantly week to week and month to month, especially much more than people realize. Uh, most people are looking, you know, at recent wins and losses to see how a team is doing. I'm far more interested in recent, you know, Corsi four, Corsi again, scoring chances for or scoring chances against numbers at 5v5 and specifically the rate stats because that's the easiest way to compare you know um i usually use a two-week sample for teams um that's not really based on anything scientific uh, but it is the sample that i've been the most comfortable with it gives me at least a little bit of a sample usually that's six or seven games for most teams and that gives me an idea and then i do use only 5v5 numbers when looking at this um the amount of time played shorthanded or on the power play in two weeks is just so little that you know one goal skews that number by a whole lot um even a couple of scoring chances you know a couple of jam plays on one power play where like four shots happened from high danger areas uh in a span of like four seconds uh, that just skews things so much uh in small um in a small uh, period of time that uh, it's just not something that I think is valuable in those short, um, in that kind of short two week window. So what I use team stats for in fantasy primarily, uh, number one, sit start decisions. Um, so looking at the team that my player, my two players are playing against and their recent performance, seeing if they're a team that has been allowing a lot of scoring chances, has been allowing a lot of uh, shot attempts against. And if that's, uh, if they're playing, if one player is playing, if I'm kind of going back and forth, I think the two players are fairly equal in their individual performance, then like the next step uh, would be to look at the team they're playing against, look at the team stats and say, okay, um, you know, player A is playing against uh, team A and team A is allowing a ton of scoring chances against recently at 5v5. Player B is playing against team B and team B is not allowing a lot of scoring chances against at 5v5 recently. And so I'll go with player A in that scenario. So that's one uh, one use for team stats that I do use on a fairly frequent basis. And then goaltending decisions. Um, you know, the variance in team stats affects goaltenders far more than any other player. I think that's kind of goes without saying. It's probably pretty obvious. If your team is playing poorly in front of you as a goaltender, you're just going to have more shot attempts, more dangerous attempts, more rush attempts, um, more likely scenarios for goals to get past you, no matter how well you personally are playing. Team 5v5 statistics are honestly the best indicator I've found for predicting goalie performance. I've heard people espouse things like Delta Fenwick save percentage, any metric that you find. Uh, it's it's an indication. Uh, all metrics are, uh, obviously, but uh, Delta Fenwick save percentage, any other metric, all metrics are an indication of how well a uh, goalie has played, right? Has played in the past, right? Um the problem that I have is that goalies are not as predictable as any other player on the ice. And therefore, using these metrics to then predict or project future player performance, it, it doesn't follow as well as it does for players because it's just not as predictable. It's I think most people feel this kind of like uh, empirically just by seeing their fantasy teams and seeing how goalies kind of uh, vary from game to game, week to week, month to month, um, but it is borne out in the data. So I just find that any of these metrics that people talk about, it's just not really a good indication of how well a goalie may play in the next game or the next month. And so I'm really uh, just hands off when it comes to all goalie metrics, quite honestly, like expected, I've uh, expected goals saved above average like all these things uh, i'm just really hands off i don't think that's valuable analysis uh, for goaltenders in my opinion really i think the best thing that you can do with goalies as you might expect coming from uh, mr zero g is stay liquid you know don't trust connor ingram or cam tell that connor ingram got lit up by the uh, colorado avalanche while i was recording this uh, don't trust Cam Talbot just because he's had a really good start here for the Kings, which, again, it's a team thing. Cam Talbot himself, I don't think, is a special goalie, but the Kings are playing exceptionally well. They're limiting all these chances, and Talbot is thriving within that system, as a lot of goalies honestly would. So, um, 
yeah, don't trust these goalies just because they've played well thus far. I think, honestly, the biggest flaw with most managers and goaltending is, you know, I guess spending dra- too much draft capital is probably the top top thing that most fantasy managers do that hurts them the most over the course of a fantasy season. But second most, I would say, is just giving goalies too much leash when they're already actively hurting your roster. Um so yeah, that's what I would say about that. I don't want to get too far into zero G stuff here, but I did want to get that out there. Uh, I did throw out a request for some Discord questions as it relates to advanced stats and how I use them. Um, just wanted to you know take the pulse of the Discord and see what people are interested in hearing about what I may not have thought to talk about uh, here just on my own. And so I did get, uh, I believe, four questions here from the Discord that I want to um, talk about because I do think they're valuable for more than just the people who ask the question. They'll be valuable for everyone to hear as well. So Reese's Pieces asks, how much stock do we put into individual player performance versus team performance when evaluating a player's rest of season projection? Is it a chicken or egg scenario where the team context matters more than the individual performance or vice versa? Um, What I would say about this is the interplay of all of these variables, all of these chance generation, efficiency stats, uh, the interplay of all these variables is the toughest part about teasing out what to expect from any individual player. Some players have great individual numbers, but subpar on ice numbers. Some have the inverse. Great, what I will say is great individual stat players generally are better bets because they are directly and primarily responsible for chance generation and therefore are less dependent on external variables for their production. Basically, by external variables, I mean their teammates. Um, Team performance absolutely matters, though. Uh, You can't discount it because it informs us whether that player is being supported in the way they normally are or not. And so... Uh, I don't want to discount that. Definitely a player is just simply not going to be able to perform if their teammates around them are not performing as well. But there are players like, um, you know, I talk about Roman Yossi and how he drives play for the Nashville Predators like almost no other defenseman does uh, across the league. And I was kind of unconcerned about Nashville, uh, unconcerned about Yossi rather, even with uh, Nashville obviously losing some players that had scored a bunch of their goals and points in the last number of years. Uh, And Yossi had a bit of a slow start, but he's been pretty hot recently. I had some big games, and I think he's well on his way to having another terrific season. And that's because he himself is the origin of a lot of that chance generation. It wasn't the players that left that really were, it was him himself. And so that's why I felt that he could sustain higher uh, levels of play. Um, And so, yeah, but finding that interplay and how much, uh, you know, players leaving or team situation changing, um, a star player getting injured, like, you know, if heaven forbid, knock on wood, Philip Forsberg gets injured uh, in the next game, how would that affect Roman Yossi? Um, These are the parts that are definitely harder to exactly figure out, and that is where a bit of subjectivity comes into it. Um, So hopefully that was helpful, um, but uh, yeah, there definitely is some some artistry, I guess, to the math (laughs) in in these cases, for sure. But, you know, what I will say is at this point in the season, we have a pretty solid sample size of what these teams are and what they've been able to put up over some ups and downs for a lot of teams already. And so that should that should inform you about what the new kind of equilibrium is for the team context for a lot of these players. And that should, you know. Um, You should be able to do kind of the math that I talked about, the on-ice shooting percentage and the IPP and all these things. You should be able to kind of do that math now at this point in the season, kind of figure out, okay, um, the IPP is still low, but actually the team, uh, the on-ice Corsi 4 and scoring chances 4 are up for this player. And so I actually think he's going to do, he could even do even better than we're expecting because he's actually on-ice for more chances because the team is performing better than expected. Duke Jaste asked, what's the best way to utilize the website Natural Statric? Terrific free resource. Is it mobile friendly? Should you use a laptop? I've logged in and been too intimidated. Where or how do I start using it properly? Uh, I will say it's not the most mobile friendly thing in the world, that website. It certainly is usable. I do use it every day on mobile. Um, 
I'll put a link to what I would consider like a jumping off point uh, for using it, um, a kind of basic jumping off point for using it. I'll put a link to yeah, a place that I start with from a lot for a lot of my analysis. That page, I'll put a link for that um, in the show description for everyone. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely a lot of things. So use that. Uh, basically, the link that I'll put in is individual um, advanced stats page. Um, then from there, you can kind of play with the filters. You know, you can do the last five games. You can see what I'm looking at when I look at that sort of thing. Uh, you can use the different filters. You can look at just uh, all the players from one team. You know, if you're, this is what I do oftentimes when I'm looking at uh, when I'm building the waiver wire show. I'm looking at you know the teams with the best schedule, and then I go to that team specifically and check out their individual numbers, see which players have the high shots per 60, see which players have the high individual scoring chances for per 60 over the last little bit, uh, especially for a team like Philadelphia, right? Uh, we talked about this, Blake and I, in the waiver wire episode. They have kind of a top nine, not a lot of separation between a lot of the players. You know, Konechny is obviously a top guy. Couturier's guy is going to get a lot of minutes, and so you feel pretty good about him. But a lot of the other players are just kind of all jumbled together. You don't know which one to pick for your streamer. And... Yeah, using uh, natural stat trick and using just going to the flyers only can really inform your decision um, in a situation like that. So that's one thing. You know, there's a compare option. If you go under the players drop down on the naturalstatric.com, the home website, uh, if you go to the compare option under the players drop down, you can select two players, compare their individual or on ice stats over any period of time. This can be really useful for, you know, an add drop decision. Um, which player you want to add, you know, which player you want to drop. Uh, trade scenarios, you can use it for stuff like that just to directly compare side by side two players uh, over, you know, the last five games, the whole season, whatever you want to do, you can filter that in there. They have in depth box scores for every game under the games tab. Uh, it compiles all the advanced stats for every player in every individual game. In this, these cases, I don't actually use rate stats. I look at the counts uh, just to see the player's effect on that individual game. Um, over time, I want to use rate stats, but for individual games, I want to see the actual numbers that they put up in that game. Uh, player index under the player's drop down is great for searching a. Uh, you know, quote unquote, puzzling player, seeing how their advanced stats this season compare to the, their advanced stats from previous seasons. So if you go to player index, you type in the name of the player, you'll see them there, you click on summary, and then that'll take you to their page, you can do, um, you can sort by, you know, all strengths, rates, and you can see, you know, is their shots per 60 this year down from last year? Is their individual scoring chances for per 60 down this year from last year? Is their on-ice numbers better or worse than last year? Is their IPP high versus their career average? You can see these things kind of at a glance, and that could be really valuable. Uh, there are more, uh, but there, those are some of the best ways to get started for sure. Um, if anybody has any specific questions on any of those scenarios or anything like that, absolutely feel free to DM me, reach out, and I will get back to you. Uh, Zuto asks, how do you weigh age, prime years, and the fall off of players in Keeper Dynasty formats? For example, do the underlying stats tend to drop off before the counting stats do? Vice versa, when a younger player is developing, is there a lag between what the underlying numbers show and the counting stats? So what I would say about this is that the reason that advanced stats are usable for predicting player performance is that they are correlated closely with actual point production. So generally, the adva advanced stats drop off at the exact same time as the production. Uh, in some cases, a player will continue to be extra efficient as the advanced stats drop off, but that's not typical. That's really just uh, kind of an unsustainable uh, situation, which can happen to any player, not really dependent on them being, you know, aging out or anything like that. I do consider age to be a risk factor. Uh, I do weigh drop-offs in chance generation more if a player is past, you know, the quote-unquote age apex. For a lot of players, you might say this is 30 plus, you know, maybe for more exceptional players, higher level players, maybe it's more like 33, 34, who knows uh, exactly. Uh, I'm, I mean, you could definitely do a study on that if you wanted to. I have not done that study, and so I won't say for sure, but... Um, you know, just thinking about, you know, the Crosby's, uh, think about a guy like Joe Pavelski producing into his late 30s, um, players like that, you know, you expect them to be able to sustain some production later into their careers for sure. So, 
Yeah, I would say if I'm looking at a player and I'm they are 33 years old and this is the first season where I'm really seeing a drop off in the advanced stats and with or without that uh, the point production being there or not, whether it's bad point production, whether it's good point production, if I see the drop off in underlying stats and they are, you know, at an advanced age, an age that you would typically expect a player to start to drop off, then I weigh that risk even more in those cases. Uh, hopefully that's a, that's a good enough answer for you there. Jason P says, what's a good way to distinguish valuable data from numbers that don't make sense? For example, as a Pens for him, as a Pens fan, I promise you they've been pretty mediocre this year and last. However, the analytics tell us that their results should be way better. What about the team's play gives a false positive that they are good? Um, so first off, uh, the way that I'll frame this is I honestly disbelieve anyone who tells me that their eye test negates the analytics. The eye test is by... It, like indisputably by nature far more subjective than the math it's wholly unreliable uh, in my opinion even from the vast majority of quote-unquote scouts that you'll find uh, on twitter uh, you know i for myself personally i watch the leafs i watch a, a lot of the leafs games um, maybe not the whole game but a good portion of the game after the kids are in bed i can unequivocally say that i make worse decisions about leafs players than any other team in the league and that's i think honestly because i allow the eye test to color my opinion of players and i don't rely on the stats as much for the leafs as i do for other teams so uh, i'll frame it that way what I will say is some team level systems are definitely designed to produce chances that show up well in analytics, but they don't correlate as closely to goal scoring as the average team system might. You know, you'll always have outliers in any sort of distribution. You know, there's 32 teams in the league, so it stands to reason that you'll have some teams that uh, will have great numbers but not have great efficiency. Um, uh, so you'll just always have outliers on either side of any spectrum, basically, uh, any distribution. Carolina's a great example of this over the last number of years. So like for the Pens specifically, let's look at the Pens. I look at a team with Malkin, Crosby, Carlson, Gensel, and I think this team should be relatively efficient. You know, they have historically efficient top end players so i might bet on the penguins in a way that i wouldn't necessarily bet on a team like the hurricanes because of that talent level because of the historical efficiency of the players that comprise that team and especially the top end players who end up you know accounting for a strong portion of that team's overall chance generation numbers um so yeah i i guess that's the way i would frame that there's definitely going to be outliers and it can be hard to identify those outliers for sure. Um, in those cases, when you're talking about certain teams and certain systems, you know, you can do more research. Uh, you can find out, you know, what the system might be. Uh, in a lot of cases, I'm looking at the players then and seeing if, you know, if I'm looking at the players and all of a sudden a lot of players are just far less efficient than they should be. And that's what's really causing um, causing the overall numbers. And they have been efficient in the past. Then that's a situation where I'm like, okay, I feel like this is a situation where the players should be able to figure it out because they have done it in the past. And so that's what I would say, I guess, about that topic. Um just kind of as a general uh, summing up, I don't know if it's really a summary, but like a general takeaway for the advanced stats and how to use them. Um, really what I want to, the way that I want to approach fantasy hockey and the way that I want to apply advanced stats is I want to avoid chasing outliers uh, because, you know, they may sustain it for the full year. You may get that William Carlson season where he just continues to shoot 23% for the entire season, even though that's wildly unsustainable. You get the Andre Kuzmenko season from last season, right? But if we consistently make decisions based on the most probable outcome, then we will make more correct decisions than incorrect decisions. And over the course of, you know, 20 plus weeks in a fantasy hockey season, you're going to make more correct decisions and that's going to have a positive impact on your lineup. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to use the numbers to support all the decisions that I'm making and to make more correct decisions than incorrect decisions. I'm absolutely going to make a lot of incorrect 
correct decisions over the course of a fantasy season. But if I'm consistent about using the framework the same way every time and using numbers that are predictive of performance, then over the course of a season, that's going to even out into you know a positive uh, outcome for my team. It may be frustrating. Uh, it may you know I may go through a stretch where for like you know, six straight weeks. Uh, I just can't get a win. All the players I'm picking for my streamers are terrible. Um, everything's just going against me. But over the course of the season, I do feel that I can um, outperform based on using a consistent uh, kind of uh, framework, a consistent framework for making decisions. So uh, that's what I'll say about that. Uh, one other note that I will make, I have written on this topic before. It was back in May 2021. Definitely, I think I've uh, evolved some opinions and some things have changed since then, but there are some interesting points in there. You know, I haven't gotten into secondary assists in uh, in this podcast. Uh, basically, I did a study uh, that you can read about in the article. I'll link it in the show description. Um, but secondary assists are not predictive year to year. It's far more likely that the secondary assists that a player gets in one year will just convert into primary assists the following year, then that they'll just go away because they were secondary assists. So I don't really factor any secondary assist um, analysis into anything that I do because I don't think it's predictive of player performance. Uh, overall, assists are more predictive than secondary assists. Um, I just don't think it's a valuable thing to be uh, wasting time on, in my opinion. So that's uh, a brief taste of what you might be able to get out of that article. There's some more stuff in there for sure, uh, but it is from uh, a few years ago at this point. So there'll definitely be some outdated references in there as well. All right. Uh, before you go, if you made it this far, if you're watching on YouTube, like and subscribe. That would really help. Trying to get to 1,000 subscribers before the end of the season. Um, we've been chugging along. I see all the subscribers. You guys are showing up and showing out, so appreciate that. Please continue to do so and help us hit that milestone. We'd greatly appreciate that. If you need more help with your fantasy team, you can check out the Apples and Geno's Patreon, also linked in the show description. That would be, uh, yeah. It would be awesome to see you in there uh, for five bucks a month. You know, I'm offering uh, basically any question that you ask, I'll guarantee an answer to it. And for 10 bucks a month, I'm doing team reviews. So if you have a team that you're, you know, just want somebody to look over and give you a sanity check on, then I can definitely do that for you uh, in the 10 bucks a month tier. So you can check that out. Um, we also have uh, a yearly option now. So you can sign up for a year, do a one time thing, and forget about it for the rest of the season. Uh, you can do that as well if you want to. Uh, yeah, I forgot to mention, but if you're listening to this on the podcast app, uh, rating and review there goes a long way as well. If you haven't made your way into the Discord server, definitely do that. Great place to hang out and talk fantasy hockey. There's been a lot of new faces this year. It's been awesome. Lots of great discussion going on in there. Uh, before I sign off, I just wanted to say, if there's anybody out there having a tough holidays, uh, holiday season for any reason, you know, you're seen, you're loved, you're needed. I hope that this podcast was a short period of time where you're able to leave some of those cares and stresses of the world behind and just enjoy a hobby you love and nerd out on some stats with me too. Uh, but that's all that I've got for this episode. Hopefully it brought you some value, helped you get a little bit better at fantasy hockey today. All the advanced stats you heard me talk about today came from Natural Stat Trick, which is a terrific free resource. Many thanks to the band there, there for supplying the music for the podcast. Be sure to check out their Spotify as well. That's it, folks. Much love. Merry Christmas. Mm -hmm.